thank you very much. So um, I tend to think I'm quite loud, but if I'm not loud enough, then you know, feel free to wave or otherwise uh, draw my attention. Um, okay, so I need to acknowledge my funder. This has to happen uh, these days. So the European Union, for the time being. Um, right. So the metaphysics of pregnancy. So what's that about? So the uh, the general project asks a central question, which is what is the metaphysical relationship between the fetus and the pregnant organism? Um, I take this to be a largely overlooked question, although there is an awful amount written in philosophy about fetuses. There is almost nothing written that considers the fact that fetuses don't float around in space, but pretty much only occur. Uh, within the bounds of another organism, namely the pregnant organism. I think it's a very interesting question in its own right, and I hope you'll agree with me by the end of the uh, talk. Um, but I think it also has some possible relevance for other metaphysical questions about the beginning of organisms, the number uh, of organisms that's out there, and the relationship between organisms or related entities. And maybe it has some relevance for ethics and law. So just as a warning, um, I mean, I have pictures in this talk that includes pictures of fetuses. Those are, of course, dead fetuses. We don't really have good pictures of living fetuses. Uh, also pictures of pregnant organisms, placentas, and blood. And as a special treat to kind of properly test our intuitions on this, I have brought along as a special exhibit a uh, real human pregnant organism, uh, <laughs> namely myself, or at least a human animal that I co-locate with. Um, so I really hope that you appreciate my dedication uh, to this lecture in that respect. Okay, so as I said, fetuses tend to occur within other uh, organisms. Um, so what is the relationship between the fetus and a maternal organism? The fetus is evidently inside a maternal organism. So uh, it seems there are at least two options. Uh, it could be a part of the maternal organism, like most of what's inside you is a part of your organism, like your heart and your kidney and your intestinal cells and all these other things. So call that the part whole model. Um, one could also think that it is not part of the maternal organism, in which case the fetus merely resides inside the maternal organism. And I'll call that the fetal container model. Right? So on that view, a pregnant organism is a bit like a... Well, it's not quite like a donut. Uh, it's a bit like a glass sphere with a hole in the middle with a fetus in it. So I just before we start, because I've, I've developed an interest in what people's pre-theoretical intuitions on this are. So who, you know, just off of the, off the top of their head would say, probably it's a part. The fetus is a part of the maternal organism. Couple of hands. Okay, more, more than I would have guessed. Uh, who says, no, I think it's not a part of the maternal organism, it's merely located inside the organism, but not a part? A couple of hands, and so a lot of people who are not willing to commit off the top of their head. Such a shame, but my students always force them a bit harder to uh, stick up their hand. Okay, so what I'm going to do, a few pre pre preliminary clarifications. Then I'm going to lay out the case that exists uh, for the fetal container model, and I'm going to argue uh, against it, say it's not very convincing. I'm going to lay out a preliminary case for fetal parthood. Uh, I'm going to argue in favor of that. I'll then deal with some objections against fetal parthood, which I'll, uh, at least in my eyes, will uh, convincingly get rid of. Uh, and then I'll briefly talk about some of the consequences. Right? So on the whole, I'm going to build a case in favor of um, the part whole model. Clarifications. So just about scope, right? we're talking about something very specific, which is pregnancy. What kind of uh, animals are pregnant? Well, placental mammals, yeah? not kangaroos. So uh, what I'm going to say doesn't apply to kangaroos, doesn't apply to amoebae either. Um, but some people come back and they say, it doesn't apply to kangaroos. And I'm like, no, no, kangaroos aren't pregnant. Uh, so, um, yeah, placental mammals only. And the other important point, uh, oh, and the flip side of that is, of course, that what I'm going to try and say, the idea is that that applies not just to uh, human placental mammals, 
But, you know, to mice, elephant, seal, dolphins, any other placental mammal out there. Because um, I think there can be a risk of thinking so much about a human case that we overlook that, you know, all these other animals are pregnant too. So at least in first instance, because I want to talk about organisms, I would like to say something about pregnancy that is relevantly consistent for all placental uh, mammals. The other important bit to stress is, in first instance, my question is about organisms, right? Um, hence the elephant seals, the dolphins, and the humans. Uh, now, of course, humans are interested because most of us think that humans are persons. And there's a lot to be asked about how persons relate to organisms. I'm not going to say much about that question, but just to bear in mind, right? When I've said something about organisms, I might not yet have said anything at all about persons. Um, second, terminology. So I'll take as the, the kind of uh, object of pregnancy what I'll call the foster. So, I mean, obviously pregnancy goes through stages, right? Uh, it starts roughly with a zygote and it ends uh, at birth. Um, and those stages are relevantly dissimilar, right? So you start with a blastocyst and a morula, and then you have an embryo and later you have a fetus and at some point the fetus becomes viable. And um, I'm going to collapse all of that into one category, which I call the foster. And a foster is deliberately uh, vague in two ways. Uh, so one way in which the foster is vague is I'm not quite sure when the foster comes into existence. I'm pretty sure that it makes sense to talk of a foster, of a pregnancy post-implantation. I'm not entirely sure uh, before. Um, it is relatively clear what the end of the pregnancy is. I think that's birth. Um, the other way in which the foster is deliberately a bit vague is that I don't think we should prejudge what the boundaries of the foster itself are. So people seem to often think, when they think of fetuses or embryos, that it's just this. But of course, you know, there's a placenta, there's amniotic fluid, there's all this other stuff that is part of pregnancy. Um, and I think there's some interesting questions um, to be asked about what the boundaries of the foster is. So I'm sort of coining this term, uh, on the one hand, to be able to talk about embryos and fetuses as one category. Um, uh, and to kind of talk about all of the pregnant material without necessarily being very specific about what the boundaries of the pregnant material is. People often object to my uh, medicalizing the uh, foster, which is okay, so we'll medicalize the pregnant organism as well, right? So here's the gravida, the gravida is the pregnant organism. That's my other bit of terminology. Uh, so, you know, there's a human gravida and there's a guinea pig. Gravida. Okay, that was it for preliminary clarifications. Right, the fetal container model. So the fetal container model, right, is the view that the foster is merely inside the gravida, but not part of the gravida. My impression is that this is our culturally dominant idea of pregnancy. Why do I think that? Well, one reason is that uh, sociologists and histori uh, historians have kind of written about all the ways in which um, the embryo and the fetus get set up and constructed as the future baby. So, for example, this is actually true, I can testify to this, if you, if you uh, have your ultrasound in the NHS, uh, you then are expected to pay about 12 pounds, which you do as a dutiful parent, and then you get some of these grainy images that people now post on Facebook of your embryo, which will look exactly the same, right? Any of the images look exactly the same. And it comes in a little uh, pharmaceutically sponsored, um, you know, bit of cardboard that kind of frames it, uh, that says, baby's first picture, right? Uh, so strong emphasis on the kind of continuity of like, this is already the baby. Um, fascinating. A, a, a pregnancy tracking website where you can uh, track your pregnancy week by week says of week two, by this point in time, uh, your developing baby is a little ball of cells, right? So very closely emphasizes the identity between, um, you know, even those few balls of cells uh, and the later baby. A lot of people have also stressed how our imagery 
of uh, fetuses that has become dominant in many ways also stresses this view. So these are the famous Life magazine pictures of, of course, dead, aborted uh, fetuses, which first graced uh, uh, the cover of Life, I think, in the 1970s in the USA, produced in Sweden, because that's, of course, where you would have aborted fetuses that you could photograph. You know, and they sort of, they, I mean, A, they set this up as a kind of a, um, pretend it's alive, but it's, you know, there's the kind of astronaut in space model of the fetus, right? There it is, bravely venturing forth. No uh, pregnant woman surrounding it, but just a fetus on its own, right? The future human in, in, in uh, the future human. Same kind of here. This also emphasizes the container aspect. There are more subtle aspects of this as well. So this is a very familiar picture from an anatomy book. And um, I mean, one thing that's very interesting about this is that fetuses aren't this color. Right? I mean, not just because not all fetuses are white, but, um, but they're basically purple uh, because the way their blood supply is routed, um, they, uh, their oxygen tension is far too low to produce that color. So there's all sorts of ways in which our imagery and our way of talking promotes this idea of, you know, this is already the later baby, and, uh, you know, it's inside that otherwise faded out entity. Uh, so that's just for cultural, I think it's interesting to note the kind of cultural promotion of that view. What are the views about this in philosophy? I think philosophy seems to uncritically copy this fetal container model. So it seems to be very widely and implicitly assumed that the fetus is merely inside the pregnant organism. Uh, you see this in explicit statements. So Smith and Broger say that it is like a tub of yogurt in the fridge. Uh, Oderberg writes that it is, an, it is an organizational unity that is not a part of its host. Uh, Hauspian writes that it's not merely a part of some other thing. But I think even more interestingly, you find kind of an implicit assumption. So, for example, animalists uh, believe that we are organisms. They believe that we were once fetuses. And they spend entire books defending this without ever even stopping to ask, well, wait. Uh, but that means that, you know, uh, you get an animal inside another animal, and is there any interesting question to be asked about that? No, 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 clearly that's just seen as non-intertwined, merely sitting inside there. Similarly, uh, when people think about maximality conditions, they happily write, uh, no cat is a proper part of a cat, which either rules out the possibility that a fetal cat would be part of a cat, or denies that fetal cats are cats. Of course, really, I mean, I've just not thought about pregnancy at all. I, I checked and Hawley said, yes, that's right, I didn't think about pregnancy. Uh, now, so we find this is seemingly widely shared an implicit assumption. You also find it in a lot of the uh, literature on pregnancy ethics. It seems to implicitly assume that the fetus is the baby inside, surrounded by a pregnant organism. But of course, what we're really interested in arguments. What arguments are there in favor of the fetal container model? I have trolled, th trolled through the literature and I've basically found two. And I'm going to argue that neither is very good. One I'll call the intuitive argument and one is a topological argument. So the intuitive argument, this is my best reconstruction of it, seems to say something like this. There's one premise which says fosters are a human. A human is a variable here because it gets spelled out in very many ways. Um, but leave it as a variable. Premise two, no human is part of another human. Uh, then there's an implicit premise that is never stated, which is that a pregnant organism is a human. Uh, therefore, fosters can't be part of, gra of a, a gravida. I mean, first of course, what's weird about this argument, right? It's just entirely focused on humans. Um, I mean, whether we would find it as convincing for mice, I don't know. There's nothing <coughs> wrong with the form of this argument. The question is, should we accept the premises? What support is there for the premises? So premise three, that uh, pregnant organisms, human pregnant organisms are human, I think we can accept. Premise one, that fosters are human. Well, if there was anything that was on a dispute, right? I mean, this is a premise that lots have been written about. Depending on how exactly you cash out human, 
uh, you know, living human entity, conscious entity, autonomous individuals, people come out with very different answers on whether fossils are humans or when they become humans. So let's leave that for the time being. But what supports the second premise, right? That no human is part of another human. Now, there's one way in which you could try and support that premise that just says, look, I'm a human and I'm not part of another human, but that um, overgeneralizes, right? Uh, Socrates was a ph uh, philosopher and he wasn't female. I mean, it doesn't follow from that, that no philosopher ever could be female. So we need something more specific. I think the other way people try to cash out this side of the premise is, is uh, to kind of think, well, it is just part of the kind of thing that a human is, whatever that is exactly, that means that it is essentially this individual, autonomous, something entity. Anyway, it's kind of the thing, it's, uh, it, it's an essential aspect of the kind of thing that a human is, that means it could never be part of another human. Now, I mean, one thing that concerns me about that premise is that you've probably just not thought very hard about uh, pregnancy. Um, but the other issue, of course, is that, well, that all then starts to depend on what you pack into the variable human. And that's the real trouble of this argument. So one thing you could do in the intuitive argument is you could fix premise one. You could say, well, we don't know exactly what a human is, but you know, it's just clear that I came from a, a fetus, and I am a human, and so, you know, fetuses uh, are also humans. I'm going to hold that fixed. So whatever a human is, it's got to include uh, fe at least fetuses. So you could do that. You could fix the first premise. But then, of course, your second premise, um, whether no human is part of another human, uh, is going to depend entirely on an empirical question, namely, are fosters part of other humans? Because if you fix that fosters are human, then the category human or the kind of thing that a human is just has to accommodate the characteristics of fosters. So this begs the question, right? It wants to have, I mean, it needs an empirical support. It asks what we are trying to prove, namely, is the foster part of another human organism? The other way you could go is you could go this way. So you could just fix premise two. You could say, look, I don't quite know what a human is, but one thing is totally clear to me, right? It must be the case that no human is part of another human because that would be too weird and humans are just, oh, whatever, essentially independent. But then, of course, the first premise, whether fosters are humans, uh, depends on whether fosters meet the kind of criteria that you set for being a human, one of which is not being part of another human. And so again, uh, the argument seems to presuppose the very question we want to ask, namely, is the foster a part of another human? So this intuitive argument doesn't work, right? It either begs the question under premise one or begs the premise under question two, or it begs the question under premise two. Uh, unless you come up with some further independent support for these premises, which I haven't really um, seen. Of course, the argument, the way the argument, I think, in fact works is that people equivocate on human. When they think of human in terms of not being part of another human, they think of this rich adult conception of the human individual. And then when they think about uh, fosters, they just change what they take the requirements for humans to be, such that it is something like mere persistence of biological material or something. So one thing this shows is we, we can't do armchair physiology. <laughs> We've got to actually think about what the criteria are for being part of an organism. Um, so that's the intuitive argument. Here's the second argument I found. Smith and Brogard have this paper that is about when we start. But as a small part of the paper, they consider the question, is a foster a part of the maternal organism? And they say, no, it is not. It is a tenant in a niche, and tenant in niches aren't part. And what is a tenant in a niche? Uh, well, um, a niche is a part of reality into which an object fits and into and out of which the object can move. So a fish in an aquarium 
is a tenant in a niche. It's not part of the aquarium, right? I mean, you could take the fish out of the aquarium, put it in a different aquarium, right? That's the kind of idea. So, it strikes me as fairly obvious that we can't move fosters in and out of their niches. Um, it'd be nice if you could, right? It'd be nice if you could open the oven, take the bun out and see if it was done. And if it wasn't, you stuck it back in. But even better if you could take it out, put it in a different oven, uh, down a bottle of gym, wait for it to be washed out of your system and then put your foster back in. That would be really great. Uh, but pregnancy is not like that. Um, so it seems a curious claim to make. Um, they say something more about it in other places where they say things like, well, tenants must have complete external boundaries. There is no topological connection between the foster and the maternal organism. And the response to that is, well, that's just simply false, right? I mean, this is, this is why I stress the boundary of foster. Fosters don't float in a cavity like a fish in an aquarium. They have an umbilical cord and a placenta. And I can talk at great length about placentas because they're very cool organs. Um, but I won't. Just take it from me or ask about me later if you want. I mean, you know, the umbilical cord grows out of the foster, grows into the placenta, and a placenta grows straight into the uterine wall. So um, this is one of my favorite pictures. But you can kind of see here that the placenta, this is a term fetus that uh, didn't survive a car crash, nor did its uh, pregnant organism. You can see that the placenta, right, this kind of meat-like surface is on the outside of the membranes that cover the foster and that's where it literally just grows into the uterus and of course there is eventually a separation uh, at birth just like you know once i chop off my finger there is a boundary between my finger and the rest of me but there really isn't a boundary prior to that um, and there's a there's a reason why women bleed to death at birth um, right, because this is the severance of what is really a topological connection, not something that's separated by membranes. Um, so it seems that on Smith, right, so the intuitive argument just begs the question. Smith and Brogard just seem to have not applied their own criteria consistently, and once they do, they would find that the foster is part of the gravida. So, so far for the fetal container model, right? Culturally dominant, widely assumed in philosophy, uh, almost utterly unargued for, and a few arguments that we have seem uh, at best to beg the question and at worst to prove the opposite point. What is there to be said as a positive case for fetal parthood? So obviously to figure out what is and isn't part of an organism, uh, we have to figure out what, in general, what is and isn't part of an organism. Now, there's two general areas where you could look to answer the question. One is kind of what metaphysicians say about organisms. One is about what philosophers of biology say about organisms. My inclination has been to go for what the philosophers of biology say about organisms because they have thought a lot harder and better about it. Now, in philosophy of biology, there's a huge literature on what organisms are. This is known as the problem of biological individuality. And there is really no consensus because organisms are extremely messy. Uh, particularly if you start looking at fungi and strawberry plants and microbiomes and, and you know, the kind of neat picture that the metaphysicians will still hold on to just utterly flies out of the window. So how do we make progress on this question? Well, my approach is not to defend a particular account of the organism uh, amongst the several accounts that are out there, but rather to consider a bunch of recurrent criteria that you find in these debates. And the strategy is to say, well, look, if it looks like a part on all these different criteria for organisms, it's probably a part of the organism. And it does look like a part on all these criteria for the organism, or so I shall argue. So here's a first uh, important line of thought about organisms, which is that organisms are these homeostasis maintaining physiologically autonomous uh, entities, right? So we all kind of on the inside of us have these extremely tightly regulated internal environments, right? Carefully regu regulated pH, automatic pressure, temperature, et cetera, et cetera, and very narrow boundaries, right? I mean, heat me up by more than five degrees and, and I'm dead. 
Um, but outside of us, right, we can uh, tolerate this extreme variety of temperatures, humidity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So one way of thinking about it is to think that the, what is part of the organism is both what is inside an internally managed homeostatic environment and what is regulated as part of that internal homeostatic environment. Um, the foster is part of the internal environment, right? It's not just in the uterus, it's in the uterine wall, right? It's within the maternal tissue. It's also regulated <coughs> as a part of the gravida. So only after birth does a baby start to pick up a whole bunch of homeostasis maintaining functions, such as kidney functions, intestinal functions, breathing, uh, temperature regulation, all of which prior to birth were done by the larger organism, right? It was regulated for it uh, through the larger maternal organism rather than something that did itself, which is why birth is a risky transition because you get babies who can't do this and they're fine <laughs> in the womb and no longer when they're out. So it seems that if you're interested in homeostasis, maintenance and physiological autonomy, the foster is part of the maternal organism. That's the physiological autonomous entity. Of course, the foster has some degree of physiological autonomy, <coughs> but that's universal in the biological world, right? My liver has some degree of physiological autonomy. Every cell in my body has some degree of physiological autonomy. But on the whole, these are managed um, as part of the larger system and so is the foster. A second important criteria is metabolic and functional integration. So the idea is that organisms are this one metabolic system, this is closely related to homeostasis maintenance, uh, right? One system of processing energy, et cetera, that works as a coherent whole. Um, again, for kind of the same reasons as I mentioned before, it seems that the foster is part of the metabolic system that is uh, the gravida. <coughs> And more often, right, I mean, a pregnancy is very actively facilitated by the pregnant organism. I mean, this is not a parasite. Uh, this is something that female mammals on the whole are completely set up to do and facilitate. And the whole of a pregnant organism makes adjustments in heart rates, <laughs> in uh, cardiac outputs, in hormone uh, systems and flexibility. I mean, the whole system changes to accommodate a pregnancy. So it seems that it, the foster is metabolically integrated. I think it's also functionally integrated. So um, the foster performs one important, if not the important functions to which we uh, organisms are put on the earth, which is to reproduce, right? That is what a foster does. It realizes a um, gravidas reproduction, reproductive function. Now, people often point out here that you, you can have conflict. You can have preeclampsia. Sometimes, um, you know, women die. And not so, not so often, actually, anymore. <laughs> but, you know, if left uh, uh, to pre-modern technology devices, some pregnant women will die, especially at birth. Um, but that's not a problem, right? So we find in general in biology that organisms need to trade survival and fitness. So uh, very many organisms, think of male stags, right? Male stags put all these energetic investments into growing these giant antlers. The antlers might get them stuck in the woods and they'll starve uh, to death. If they make it to the autumn season, they'll spend you know, a couple of weeks running around, fighting other stags, possibly getting killed, using all these energetic resources to try and produce offspring. Some of them die at the end of the mating season because they've just exhausted so much energy. But stags would live much longer if they just thought, screw that, <laughs> I'm just going to eat a patch of grass here. But yeah, that's not what organisms do. I mean, some do, but they, they don't generate offspring, so their they're, they're line dies out. So that we have a survival between, uh, that we have a trade-off between survival and fitness, uh, or survival and reproduction, is an entire normal feature of the biological world. It's an extreme conflict between the uh, foster and the gravidas pathological, like preeclampsia, 
Statistical conflict is just a normal feature of biology. And uh, I've had in the past people then argue that it should only be uh, survival that determines what's part of the organism. Uh, I just thought I'd spare you the embarrassment. Don't say that unless you also want to argue that your testicles aren't a part of you. If you want to argue that, then be, be my guest. Um. Okay, now you... Actually, I'm going to skip that and leave that to the question. So here's a third type of criteria. Some people think that what are the boundaries of the organism that is determined by what is immunologically tolerated. And immunology should be seen broadly here in a way that also encompasses fungi. Luckily, the people that uh, defend those views have actually thought about pregnancy and they say, uh, the foster is immunologically tolerated, right? I mean, obviously. Again, in a normal case, uh, pregnant organisms don't reject uh, the foster, right? They welcome it. Uh, of course, you get exceptions to this, but we consider those pathological, just as in an autoimmune disease, I might well reject um, parts of my body, and that would be a pathology. And the fourth criteria, people often think that organisms are at least topologically continuous, and we've already talked about that. Uh, it seems that a foster um, does have topological continuity with a pregnant um, organism, right? It's the percent of the umbilical cord, it's in the uterine wall, etc. So it seems that if you go through a bunch of recurring criteria that get used for figuring out what organisms are, what the boundaries of organisms are, on all of them, the foster comes out of a part. Right? Which makes me like, well, if it looks like a part, it talks like a part, we've got a good case for thinking this is a part. That doesn't mean there's not more to say here. I think this raises some very interesting questions for philosophy biology that are part of the project to work out further. Amongst others, if uh, fossils are a part, how should you then think about a del delineation between, you know, between generations? Uh, and it might be really helpful here, weirdly, to think about you know, things like fungi and strawberry plants. So strawberry plants you know, grow as a part out of these shoots, which are, for quite a while, clearly part of the original plant, but you know, are also already clearly identifiable as possibly future plants themselves, or that, that's up to debate whether they're really separate plants. So there's some interesting things to be done in philosophy biology there, but I, I would focus on that. Okay, so so far it seemed we had nothing to say in favour of the fetal container model. There's at least, a, I think, a, a case to be made for the part whole model, but there's, you know, there's a lot more research to be done. I would just want to go through a few objections that always come up. Uh, save you the effort. So people always come back and say, but surely it's not a part because it's genetically different. And yes, it is genetically different, but organisms aren't genetically uniform. Uh, there are very few people in, in philosophy biology who think that, who hold a genetically essentialist view of the organism. That's only something that you find in kind of places like The Economist and other uh, places that report really badly on science. Um, you know, we have lots of DNA cells, we have lots of cells in our body that have modified DNA. Um, Lots of, well, actually, maybe not quite so much in this room, but some of us, at least, uh, will have uh, multiple strands of DNA in our bodies. So pregnant women um, usually pick up fetal cells during pregnancies, which lurk around in their body for decades uh, and are found all over the body. Nobody quite knows what they do there. You also get really interesting cases of uh, macrochimerism, where... This is effectively what would have been a dizygotic twin, set of dizygotic twins, except they meet in the uterus, they fuse, right? The cells don't, I mean, not the individual cells fuse, but the two blastocysts fuse, and they form one organism, and that organism will have the cell line of one sibling in, you know, say its kidneys might be made out of the cell line of one sibling, but its skin might be made out of the cell line of another organism. It seems bonkers to think that that is, I mean, for all we know, I could be such an organism, right? <laughs> I could be the merger of two genetic, uh, genetically different lines. It seems bonkers to think that wouldn't be an organism. So genetic essentialism is just a bad view. Um, a lot of people say, look, but the foster can't be a part 
because it has a, a future of its own or it is viable, or once it's viable, it can't be a part, or it's separable, so it can't be a part. Now, there's, there's two versions of this. One focuses on viability, and it says, look, a uh, foster, or at least a foster after a certain uh, time, uh, can separate from the maternal organism and survive <coughs> as a baby, so it's not a part. That, to me, just seems to confuse this position with its realization, right? I mean, I could break this glass, that means that it's fragile, but it's not broken until I've actually thrown it on the floor and broken it, right? So equally, sure, after a certain time, a foster can separate, but it is not separate until we actually separate it, and it's perfectly possible to be a part before that. Another version says, look, it's not just that it can, what have I done with, oh, there it is. Another version says, look, it's not just that it can become separate, it will become separate, and therefore it's not a part. Same kind of worry applies about uh, confusing this position with its realization, right? I guarantee you that I will die, but that doesn't make me dead now, um, right? It only means I'm dead once I've actually died. So the fact that the a foster will separate at some point doesn't make it non-separate now. Also, of course, organisms lose stuff all the time, right? Uh, kind of macro stuff, cells, skin cells, semen, uh, all sorts of hair, right? Um, and once you look at molecules or something, if something that was once going to leave the organism wasn't part of the organism, nothing would remain of an organism. I mean, the question isn't whether the foster can separate and will one day be separate. Sure, it, it will be. But the question is, when does it separate? And prior to separation, it seems it's apart. Third, people often say, but surely the foster can't be apart because, you know, it's morally very different from your kidney or your hair or your other parts. Sure, I think fosters are a morally interesting part but their moral relevance doesn't dictate whether they're part or not, um, I take it. I mean, many of our parts differ in moral relevance, right? I mean, we think that my hair, I think, is morally different in all sorts of ways. Think what would happen if you pulled out my hair as opposed to if you pulled out my kidney, right? I mean, um, it's perfectly possible, in fact, probably obvious, that a foster is a morally interesting and morally special part. Um, but the fact that it's morally interesting doesn't dictate our metaphysics, doesn't tell us whether it's a part or not. And finally, people then start coming up with other questions about surrogacy and about conjoined twins, and I will certainly start thinking about those, but I think it is very important to stress something, that, which is that we start a metaphysical analysis with a normal case, and of course pregnancy is the normal case, right? This is the utterly mundane way of human reproduction. Pregnancy is a totally non-weird way of human existence. And I think we should try and make an attempt of understanding that first, because we, before we start thinking that somehow, um, you know, we should think of like conjoined twins as the thing that uh, should determine our metaphysical views. Okay, <coughs> so uh, what I hope to have done is at least giving you uh, some reasons of thinking that the fetal container model yeah, is really seriously lacking in support, um, which I think is on its own relevant because that seems so widely assumed and so widely asserted. I think it's important to stress that if you want to sort that model, right, you have to have you have to provide some evidence. <laughs> you really can't going on assuming that model. I think um, there's a case to be made for the part whole model, though that case could still be stronger. What are the implications uh, for that? Oh, I just said this. What are the implications of that? Well, people always say, what are the implications for ethics and law? So, I mean, first of all, I, I, I would like to stress, I mean, you probably asked me about this in the question, so I won't say too much about it, but you know, there is more to be thought about in the connection to pregnancy and fosters than just abortion. I think there's a big problem in literature here that we're too obsessed by abortion. There's all sorts of interesting ethical and legal questions about pregnant women, such as how much they owe their fetuses if they're going to bring them into existence, and interesting ethical questions about surrogate pregnancies and how we construe a surrogate relationship. But as should be obvious, there are no direct inferences from metaphysics 
to ethics, right? I mean, there are further questions um, to be asked here. So nothing I've said, I think, clinches any moral claims. Nonetheless, I do think there are probably some implications. So it seems that a lot, if not all, uh, our legal and moral frameworks and principles uh, presuppose that there are individual organisms with individual bodies who have independent existences with which others mostly don't interfere, and sometimes they do, and then there's something to be discussed. And um, possibly uh, that is a, well, if the part whole claim is true, that is a presupposition that is just false, right? It's just a mistake, it's just an artifact of not thinking about pregnancy. And so that means you have a serious question about how you would apply any of those to the situation where humans aren't in possession of their own body, aren't physically distinct, don't, normal stand, don't normally stand in relationships of non-interference. And possibly that means that you would have to rewrite the lot for pregnancy. So we have a separate paper in which we're kind of working that out for the doing allowing distinction, which is really interesting. I also think it's interesting that fewer inferences are licensed. So what often happens now is people will make a claim such as the foster is a human and then they will infer lots of things from this, like it has a right to X. But often that inference presupposes that humans always have their own bodies non-interfered with existence, etc., etc. So um, both are kind of legal frameworks and the inferences that we think follows from calling something an organism or a human or something might need some very serious re-evaluation in light of the metaphysical facts, um, which some of us perhaps already realized, but um, maybe this makes the case stronger. And maybe it can actually give some answers about how you would sensibly write these things. I also think there are possible broader consequences for metaphysics. So maybe there are implications for when we begin or for how many human entities there are. All right, how many human entities are right here? Um, again, uh, I don't think anything is clinched here. So um, although these questions are possibly interrelated mm. about whether uh, the foster is a part of an internal organism, might be related to a question about when humans begin or how many human entities there are, uh, but they're not necessarily interrelated because they depend on further assumptions. Um, so, for example, right, think back to the assumption no human organism is part of another human organism. Uh, if you combine that assumption with a part whole claim, right, then you can you get the results that fosters aren't human organisms, right? Because fosters are part of another human organism. Your assumption is that no human organism is part of another human organism. Uh, so fosters can't be a human organism. Now you can do two things, right? You can accept the consequence or you could reject the assumption. And I suppose that there are quite a lot of assumptions or quite a few assumptions perhaps in metaphysics or about humans that uh, might come under serious pressure if they're combined with the view um, that fosters are part of the internal organism. And then another question is, well, are there consequences for us, right? So maybe, uh, are there consequences for persons? Are there consequences for the way that we relate? Well, again, there are no consequences without further assumptions about the relationship between person and organism, and there are very many views about the relationship between persons and organism. I mean, if you think that persons are, you know, non-material minds, uh, the fact that the foster is part of the maternal organism doesn't tell you anything about, um, you know, if the foster has uh, a mind already, but suppose it already does have a non-material mind. It doesn't tell you anything about whether the foster's non-material mind is part of the maternal non-material mind. It means it could be completely separate. I don't know what the metaphysics of non-material minds is in the first place. But there's an exception to this view, right? So <coughs> animalists, as I mentioned before, um, don't uh, make any distinction between organisms and persons. They think that we are organisms. Uh, they tend to also be committed to the view that we were fetuses. And so if you then add a part whole claim, that animalists at least are committed to the view that you know, we, you, 
uh, I was say, you were all part of your mother, I was part of my mother, and of course, you know, uh, my children were once part of me. I think that's kind of interesting, uh, personally. Um, I think that's really interesting because it raises questions about what, you know, what is the relationship between the, the relationships, dichronic relationships in terms of personal identity between you and your parts that go on to have separate futures, right? Do I have a, a kind of a larger part that goes on to be a mother in about four months? And then do I have a smaller part that goes on to be a baby in about four months? Uh, what is my relationship to these two lines? Sets up a very different picture of, of personal identity. Now, you might think that's massively counterintuitive. I don't know, I don't really deal with intuitions. But here is one thing that I found really interesting, and people have been sending me in this material. So lots of people seem to think this is counterintuitive. Uh, but here's a famous essay on pregnancy by Iris Marin Young, who's a, a phenomenologist. She writes, later I look with wonder at my mushy middle and at my child, amazed that this yowling, flailing thing, so completely different from me, was there inside part of me. Now I think almost everybody who reads this thinks that is metaphor. But of course, if you're an animalist and a part whole claim is true, it doesn't have to be metaphor at all. This could just be literal. And we find this kind of claim in other places. So here is uh, Judith Jarvis Thompson, who's not a phenomenologist at all, um, who in her famous paper uh, that makes the uh, violinist who can hooked up to your kidney analogy of abortion, of course, on the one hand, describes pregnancy as the use of one's body by another. And then later on in the same paper says, a woman may be utterly devastated by the thought of a child, a bit of herself, put out for adoption and never seen or heard of again. Um, and this is not a recent phenomenon either. So here's a poem written in the 1790s that says, she longs to fall to her maternal breast, part of herself, yet to herself unknown. So I think there is certainly scope uh, for taking seriously some of these views, not just in terms of their metaphysical uh, arguments, but it's interesting that I think they map on to statements that recur that seem metaphorical, but maybe, maybe they aren't metaphorical at all. Maybe we should read them, uh, read them literally. Thank you.